Welcome everybody to opening night of Books and Coffee at Concordia. I'm glad to see you all. And I always like to start out thanking friends of Concordia because it's their support that makes these programs possible. So thank you friends and please become a friend. I'm thrilled to finally welcome our author tonight. Uh, I met her at a writer's conference she was on a panel at AWP in Boston two years ago now, and I was so impressed, and then I read her book, and she was gonna come in February, I was so excited, but we had snow. So she graciously offered to reschedule, and as luck would have it from that snowy February to today, she has a new book. So what could be better? It was perfect. And tonight I've asked Dr. Mandana Nakai to introduce her because um, she is Dean of Academic Affairs of Traditional Undergraduate Programs and Professor of English here at Concordia. But she, like our guest, is a scholar of world literature, passionate about language and writing, and a native of Iran. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mandana Nakai. Good evening and welcome. It is an honor to welcome Prochista Khakpur to Concordia College, New York. I enjoyed reading her debut novel, Sons and Other Flammable Objects. Her award-winning coming-of-age story about immigrant identity, assimilation, and the universal struggle of sons to define themselves in the shadow of their fathers. Of course, 9-11 and its aftermath figure prominently in that book as they do in her most recent novel. Published by Bloomsbury this past May, The Last Illusion has been hailed as utterly original, compelling, gripping, at once amusing, deeply sad, and wonderful, and audaciously ambitious. Inspired by the great medieval Persian epic poem, The Book of Kings, Shahnameh, by Ferdowsi, Prochista Khakpur draws on ancient myth, poetry, psychology, music, and popular culture as she completely reimagines these stories to create her own unique version. In The Last Illusion, Zal is raised as a bird until he is adopted by a behavioral analyst and brought to New York to live. And Hakpur's wondrous bird boy protagonist is not without Emily Dickinson's hope but Hakpur reminds us those things with feathers also come with sharp claws and beaks. Zal's story is both heartbreaking and funny, at once realistic and surreal. Perhaps because English is her second language, Hakpur pays careful attention to the words, their sound and the rhythm, their bite and beauty, and the result is magical. Born in Iran, Prochista Khakpur moved to Pasadena, California at nine years old when her family fled Iran's Islamic revolution that was followed by the terrible war between Iran and Iraq. She attended Sarah Lawrence College and the Johns Hopkins Writing Seminar MA program she has been awarded fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, Johns Hopkins, Northwestern University, the Sewanee Writers Conference, Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, U Cross, and Yaddo. Her nonfiction has appeared in Harper's, The New York Times, The Los Angeles Times, Spin, Slate, and Salon, among others. She currently lives in uh, New York City and teaches at Columbia, Fordham, and Wesleyan Universities. Please join me in welcoming Prochista Hagfur. Oh, 
This is so exciting. I didn't actually realize they really have this water. I love that. There I am in my book on the, that. I have to keep that forever. That's great. Um, thank you so much for coming out. Um, this, you know, I went to Sarah Lawrence, so it's always such a joy to come out here. Um, I used to still try to sneak up to Sarah Lawrence once in a while after my first novel came out um, to just write in their library. I just loved being just a little bit out of the city, and it's just so beautiful. Um, so you're all very lucky. Um, so I think what I will do is, um, I've been told you know, it would be good to tell you a few things about myself and then go into reading, I think, about two sections I'm going to read. Um, but thank you so much for that lovely introduction. That really does say a lot of it. Um, but basically, I, my work is sort of divided between nonfiction and fiction. I, I have two novels, and I'm now about a third to halfway through a third novel. And then I'm also, I think when Ellen saw me at the ADP conference in uh, Boston, I was on a panel for nonfiction writers. It's always been very interesting because nonfiction writers always ask me to, to speak, but yet I had not published a memoir or a book length work of nonfiction. I just had uh, been somewhat commissioned by the New York Times to write a series of essays. And then it, it evolved a bit, but basically for about four or five years, I wrote fairly regularly for them. And it was exciting. Uh, it was in the New York Times op-ed section. Those editors are no longer there, by the way. There's been a huge revolution at the New York Times. So. Those guys have moved on. But it was a very exciting time because we kind of, we were sort of creating a different type of personal essay there. Um, it was the first time that the personal essay had a home in an op-ed section, which was very unusual. Um, and I, I'm kind of excited to know, I wasn't sure if this was right, but I talked to my editor recently. They, he believed I was the first of a flock of uh, literary fiction writers who was brought to write personal essays in an op-ed format. Um, so they were always a little bit political, but political always took a back seat to the personal um, and cultural and pop cultural. So in a way, I can now see that the New York Times was telling me to write about my Iranian-American family as a way of like, kind of spreading awareness about Middle Easterners at a time when, you know, well, when has it ever been a perfect time in America to be Middle Eastern, I guess. But uh, especially in the post 9-11 era, it was pretty difficult. So we, they were very um, gentle, the way they told me to, to write about some things. And once in a while, I'd get annoyed. I mean, at one point, I wanted to write about the, uh, the old uh, hit series 30-something. You guys remember 30-something? And I wanted to write about they were re-issuing um, the like DVD edition of 30-something, and I thought it was interesting to write about 30-something now that I was 30-something. And I said that to my op-ed editor, and he said, oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, let's do an op-ed about 30-something. But could you put an Iranian-American twist on that? <laughs> and I thought, what, are, what? no, wait, <sighs> you know? And another time, they, and it was Barbie's 50th anniversary or something. Oh, can you put an Iranian-American twist on that? It was very challenging, actually, because these things have nothing to do with each other. But to create that connection, I saw as, you know, I've always been a problem solver. And so I thought it, saw it as a kind of, um, exercise in, in, in like taking disparate objects and like mashing them up. So I kind of did create this weird essay for myself that then many uh, different venues asked me to uh, write. And it was, they were all sort of humorous, uh, darkly humorous, but involved a little bit of politics, pop culture, and then my own personal history. Um, I'm now actually am working on a memoir, uh, though it um, has more to do with my illness than my heritage. I have late stage Lyme disease that I've been battling for the last six, six plus years. And, um, but, you know, I still, I still write, you know, nonfiction as well as fiction was my first love. Um, and I think that's what I'm going to really read for you guys uh, tonight. Fiction is really what made me want to um, be a writer. You know, I, I was very, very reluctant to do, and especially even when the first flock of Iranian American memoirs came out, I was kind of a bit vocally critical of them. Not so. I mean, I love many of them. Marjane Satrapi's Persepolis. I think everyone should read, and that should be revered. I mean, she's pretty flawless, and of course, other Nafisi and a lot of the writers who were in that first wave were wonderful, but. I, I sort of found the way publishers handled that to be problematic. 
um, because they wanted to see the same sort of memoir over and over again, and it became kind of, I don't know, it was just a bit much. It started to feel like, remember the movie Not Without My Daughter? It all felt like Not Without My Daughter to me. Like, I didn't even feel like these were real Iranians writing about their families. It was just publishers. You could feel the hands of publishers in there. And so I was, I, I've been a little bit, you know, reluctant with, with memoirs, but... How, you can't really escape them now, and there's a reason why people connect with it. So I've I've come to love them. Anyways, there's this one has a little less. They always say the first novel is the um, the most autobiographical, and for me, Sons and Other Flammable Objects was very autobiographical because I was a stand-in for the Sun, so people would think it was my brother that I was writing about. Poor guy would all over New York City. People would be like, Oh, hey, how does it feel to have your sister write about you? And he was like, no, I, it's not me, I promise you. But he looked the part, he was the age of the protagonist, he had the same birthday as him, and I purposely did that, to put all the attention on this poor kid that I tortured my whole life. Um, but it was really just me, and my, my dad and I had a very sort of odd father-son kind of competitive relationship. Um, I was kind of a tomboy growing up, and we were very, we were definitely like, Rose, I felt, but um, this book was um, a departure from that. It was, it, this is a fabulous book. Uh, most of it is in a sort of magical realist vein, and um, it really is about the coming of age of a feral child. Even the concept of feral child is something that not everyone believes in. Many people think most of the cases are hoaxes. So, but mine, it, you know, my bird boy, he, he really is, for the bulk of this book, is tortured by feeling like he still is a bird. He was raised by one until he was 10 years old. Um, and it's, it's his, there's a love story, there's his coming of age, and then there's his friendship with a magician who is the, the magician of the title, The Last Illusion. But there actually is something kind of true at the basis of this, and that's what was mentioned in my intro, is that this is based on a Persian myth. So if you tell the synopsis to any Iranian, they'll immediately recognize the story of Zal. Zal is one of the most famous characters of uh, Persian folklore, though there are many in the Shahnameh to pick from. This is a text that's the size of a phone book and has you know 50,000 couplets in it. It's a medieval text. And for Iranians, this is like, I, I usually say it's like a combination of you know, uh, the Canterbury Tales, the Odyssey, and the Old Testament. You know, but every Iranian can tell you a story from it. It's, it's virtually impossible for them not to be able to, right? Yeah. So Zal was the one I connected with because he was an outsider, and I had a very difficult um, experience as an immigrant here, and I had really, really struggled with being an outsider. And it, cause I, I, mainly because I moved to a community where there were no Iranians. This is Pasadena, California. And uh, we were very um, isolated. And then when we would go to the Iranians in the Tehranjalis part of LA, um, they were of a different social class and just, they were very, my family, you know, mostly academics and, and they really lost a lot when they came here. So we just really were very un disconnected from Iranian culture in certain ways. But my father would read me stories from the Shahnameh every night. And that was a big part of my, um, my upbringing. So I'll read you the preface so you can have a little bit of background of just the Persian myth. Though I really wrote it so that you wouldn't even have to know anything about this. So someone who didn't understand the Persian would just, and the book could stand on its own, in other words. But here's just a two paragraph preface at the beginning. The Shahnameh, Book of Kings, is the most famous Persian work of art of all time, the national epic of Iran. Penned by Persian poet Ferdowsi circa 81,000, its 50,000 couplets chronicle a Persia's past from the creation of the world until 7th century Islamic conquests. Throughout the centuries, what is history and what is myth has been considered almost entirely irrelevant by Iranians. One of the Shahnameh's most celebrated stories is the story of Zal. Psalm, a great hero of ancient Persia, has a son, Zal, who was born an albino. The whiteness of the infant's skin horrifies his parents, so they abandon him on the highest point in Iran, Mount Damavand. He is discovered by an enormous bird, the mythical Seymour, whose wingspan turns the entire sky black when she takes to flight. She becomes his caretaker in the wild. Many years later, a strong, silver-skinned young man is spotted residing in a bird's nest. 
Sam hears of this, and when he comes to investigate, he realizes the young man is his son. The Seymour hands all over to his home kingdom, but not without a final gift, three of her own feathers. She tells Zal she'll be back at his side immediately if he only takes one simple action. And she says, burn this if ever you have need of me, and may your heart never forget your nurse whose heart breaks for love of you. Against all odds, Zal becomes one of the greatest warriors of ancient Persian legend. So this is really the backstory. And I would say only about 10% of this book takes place in Iran at all. Um, the rest of it is all in, in New York City, and in a New York City that we all live in. Um, in a recreated summer before 9-11 mostly, but basically between the Y2K era through the event. Um, but I'm going to start with, with a section that actually is from um, the Iranian section. Um, and this is in rural Iran around the time of the revolution. And this is when Zal gets discovered. And, and you'll, you know, Zal, Zal is basically have, has been kept captive by an elderly mother. And um, she didn't know she could, she, she had him very late, you know. And he, she has all these birds in her veranda. She loves birds. And she decides... All her other children are gone and grown in, in Tehran, but she decides that she's going to raise this child as a bird, so she builds cages for him, and he's there until he's 10 years old, and then he gets discovered by one of his older siblings. Um, incidentally, this is actually based on a case in 2007 in Russia of a bird boy who was just found chirping outside of a cage, uh, just could not speak, and was emaciated. And, and interestingly, this ran in the Daily Mail and a couple papers in 2007, and then there's been no talk of it after that. And this is usually the case with feral children. If you're a journalist and your beat is feral children, you're not going to have much of a career because people, A, don't want to hear about it, and B, they don't always believe it because a lot of high-profile cases were hoaxes. But it, it is, it's truly just shocking to imagine this can happen. But in this case, my muse was, was real, I believe. Okay, so... Hundreds of miles away, the country was swept up in considerable revolution in the capital. But the dozen or so families that lived in Khanum's village did not speak of the uprising. They knew of it, heard whispers here and there. Sometimes someone would have a paper, a city cousin, a phone call from friends. But they were largely untouched by it. The women sat by their looms when not in their kitchens, the men out in fields with their crops when not in nearby factories or mines, and the children huddled restlessly in the one classroom the village had when they weren't out in the streets, chasing innumerable dogs and occasional cars, the only uproar a village like that knew. They had nothing, nothing to revolt for or against. Life might have gone on this way had child number seven not come to town. It was Zari's first visit in years, None of Hanum's children ever bothered anymore, disturbed, no doubt, by their mother's disintegration into a crazy bird lady. But Zari burst in, armed with a young man who was clearly not her lover, the daughter no man would take. Hanum secretly considered her too thin and too arrogant child. Shame on you, Zari screamed, me, you rotten hell forever for this. Once the whispers of the neighbors had made it back to her just days before, Zari had dropped everything and grabbed a friend and sped all the way through desert highways to a place she couldn't believe she once knew as home. Her purse was heavy with the reward for the spying neighbor who had decided enough was enough with the rumors and the sounds and shadows. He had climbed the fence into Hanum's yard and veranda late one night and had seen the same last child. The one Hanum had sworn was taken away to live with relatives in the city, squatting, motionless, eyes closed, suspended in a cage that was so small he looked almost bound in a wiry eggshell, like a tiny half-dead child embalmed in a womb jail. The neighbor had talked and talk added to talk, and Hanum had been oblivious to it all. When Zari arrived, Hanum was unable to fathom that these nosy neighbors had gone so far as to find her daughter in the city, fill her with their talk, infuse her with that criminal hysteria, and in effect bring about the end of Hanum's life, not to mention their lives, the birds, the only lives she cared for. Rotten hell, she managed to muster a hard laugh at her daughter. This is hell, but that's why my birds are here. They're the only heaven in all this hell, except for that one, of course. Zari's young man was kneeling before the cage, silently taking pictures of the frightened and apparently human creature. 
He whipped out many other machines, too, that apparently recorded their words and their images. Hanum was momentarily distracted by these miracles, artifacts that would forever serve as the only testament to the global phenomenon Bird Boy's early existence. Zari could not take it. She pushed her mother and her friend out of the way and took the boy out of the cage. As much as he flapped and screamed and shivered and drooled in her arms, she would not let him go. She said her name over and over, Zari, 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 I am your sister, your sister, your sister. But it was no use. She cried and cried, shaking him gently in her arms. Poor baby, poor baby, poor baby. White Demon was at that point 10 years old. He could not talk. He could not walk. He could not identify a sister as a sister, his mother as his mother, the young man a young man, human as human. What he did know, the other birds and maybe some god they believed in. What he could do, chirp, tweak, coo, shriek. He could squat and jump, flap his elbows and fingers in the air like wings, piss and shit right there in his cage, peck at and bite into foods and water and consume them, but just in bits. Sleep in that squat and perhaps even dream, but who could know but the birds? Zari eventually bound the weeping, hysterical Hanum up in the yarn, the only restraint she could conjure, bound her and bound her hard until Zari could gather her wits and find a way for them and White Demon to get out. The young man, lost in the awful poetry of the situation, said to Zari, she calls him White Demon of all things, but this child is like the parable Zal, white like Zal and raised by, well, not just one great bird, but all birds. This is the Shahnama Zal. He's our Zal, yes, Sari said, and turned to that thing, apparently her brother, and with her voice cracking and even crumbling, she asked him, do you want to be Zal, love? Are you Zal? But the boy wouldn't look at them, any of them. He just sat there shuddering in a state of incomprehensible emergency, eyes cast to the narrow swatch of sky the window permitted. Sari had let the young man, a filmmaker, shoot more when, while she made calls. She had finally left her mother still bound in the hands of the police while she and her filmmaking companion took the boy in his cage, he was used to it after all, out and into the world for the very first time. Weeks later, a rumor, Hanuma died in prison by her own hands. The prison refused to confirm the exact cause of death, but another prisoner said on the filmmaker's tape, she kept claiming she was nothing without her children. We asked her, well then why did you do that to the little Zal child? And she said, no, not him. He can go to hell, the white demon. I mean my real children. We told her her children are all fine and all grown, and she said, no, the children I have now. She had meant her birds. One day the guard told her they had burned her birds out of cruelty, and maybe he was just sick of hearing about them. The next morning we found her pulseless with her hands still locked at her neck. So that's very, very early in the book. A um, bit of a... <laughs> intense stress like page eight. Um, but believe it or not, like my first novel, which also deals with tragic events, um, there's a lot of humor also in my essays, as I said. But um, the second section I'll read is a more humorous section, and a little bit lighter. And it takes place in New York now. So flash forward, Zal is now in his early 20s. And he's, he's done quite well, better than they've thought. Um, he's, not as, he's not physically disabled as they thought. Um, he, he only minorly, and he, he is able to have a girlfriend, and he's starting to have friends. It's pretty difficult. He fights one big urge that he's had, which is a, a sort of tendency towards insect candies, because he still has these bird-like urges. So he's found out on the internet he can buy insect candies, and he hoards them. He's very ashamed of his father or, or people realizing that he, that he still has these bird impulses. But, you know, he goes through... He, you know, his rite of passage is not just becoming a man, but becoming human. But I t toy with that idea a lot. And so one of his big, big uh, challenges is getting a job for the first time. And so he, he does pretty badly at, at several of them. But he, if, at some point, he decides that he, a great fit for him would be working at a pet store. And that would make a lot of sense. You know, that, that, that's sort of where he belongs. And, of course, it doesn't work out so well. So this is that section. Um, and then I will open up to questions. I love questions, so ask me anything. Um, okay. So he decided to immerse himself more fully in that soothing, dumbing thing, work. He paid attention to the store more than ever, compulsively asked patrons if they needed help, until one old lady complained, swearing she'd been asked at least a half dozen times in the half hour she was there. 
and he swept, cleaned, folded, washed, and tended to every animal or human that he was supposed to tend to. He became a super worker of sorts and found a surprising amount of pleasure in that. It was simple, he was good, the contract was clear, the end. There was one creature he took a special interest in. She was a tiny blonde, tiny but still voluptuous, round in all the right places. She's particularly feisty, quick, hot-tempered, sassy. He was around her all day, she never left his sight. She'd sing once in a while, and it was the sweetest singing he thought he'd ever heard. She was, he hated, downright detested, resented, abhorred to admit, a bird, a canary to be exact. He could not help himself. Saul saw those words on his tombstone, and he knew it was certainly time to quit his job when he started to develop feelings for, of all things, a canary. Luckily, he didn't have to quit. He was fired just 10 days after he confronted his infatuation. He was given a warning for taking the bird out of his cage for no one but himself, then for unsuccessfully sneaking her in his pocket during his lunch break, then for attempting to take her with him to the bathroom. Saul, I don't know what's going on here, the manager had said, but I need your hands off the goddamn bird. If you want to buy it, it's one thing. He had considered it, of course, but he knew, like a former junkie before a free bag of heroin, that if he went there, it really would be the beginning of end. Goodbye, normalcy. Goodbye, new life. Hello, yesterday, and all its infinite sicknesses. He said it would never happen again. Until one evening, during closing, whether he meant to do it or not, he took her out and let her go into the night sky. He claimed it was an accident, that he would pay for it, that they could take it out of his paycheck. Sorry, Zal, the manager said. I'm probably crazy for thinking you got obsessed with a bird, but you freed the same one you kept playing with. I'm in this business because it's just a bunch of animals, no drama. The thing with you and that bird was weird. What's it going to be next, iguana or the rat terrier? I can't have employees get all attached. I love animals too, and I'd love it if they were free to rule the world, but I've got to run a business. Zal nodded and nodded and nodded. He was grateful for the interpretation. And in many ways, he was grateful to go through it, another human step, being fired from a job. It was fine. He could get another one. That night, he went home happier than usual. He gazed at the sky as he took those automatic steps and thought to himself, somewhere a beautiful creature is free. He missed her a bit, but he reminded himself that he didn't even know her or couldn't know her. He reminded himself that she had entered his life to test him. And he had failed. But the beautiful thing about failure in humans, as he was realizing over and over, was that it was not just permitted, but in many ways supported. Failure was part of the condition of life. Many years later, Pet's Delight on the Upper West Side was shut down because the owner was caught selling dozens and dozens, perhaps more than a hundred, canaries to a ringleader of a canary fighting ring upstate. Canary fighting was a shock to most people, but not to Zal, who had grown up around them. They could fight, indeed. But it all reminded Zal of his canary and her rescue on the last day of his work. Sometimes, as they said, things really did happen for a reason. He felt that mixture of heartbreak and relief that had defined all of his life's many near misses. And I'll stop there. So uh, thank you. Um, I guess I can take any question. Uh, that actually is also true, by the way, that, that there, is a, there was a bust in, in Connecticut, not upstate. Um, of a canary fighting ring in about 2011 or 10, I want to say. That, that's the thing people do, canary fighting. You see, that's the thing when you write a fabulous book, it's like the world is much crazier than, than any fiction. So, you know, I, people ask me about where I could get all these crazy subplots and storylines and stuff, and it's just from reading the news. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, any, any questions? Anything. Yes. Can you talk to us about his very brave effort to confront his fears by going to the poultry processing factory? Oh, yeah. Well, he does a lot. Well, the, the one thing that he does is, I think this might be, he takes a job at, like, a fried chicken place, which is really bad. I mean, it's, he's having kind of a nervous breakdown through much of this, you know. Um, he's really struggling, and so, especially because his girlfriend is very troubled. She is a, uh, she believes she's clairvoyant, but she's also anorexic, and she's just a mess herself. And this is, you know, his first girlfriend. And so he's really having a lot of issues. So he decides to work for this um, 
Brian, it seems to, a lot of people remember this as sort of a harrowing part of this book. It was kind of harrowing for me to write it, but he does work at a place where they're like frying poultry, you know, and it's very difficult for him. And I think it's like Valentine's Day or something with his girlfriend, he tries to break up with her and he just brings buckets of fried chicken to their home. And suddenly, like she like wakes up or something. I, can't, I actually can't remember because I never read from that section. I, people find it like too disturbing and I felt disgusting when I wrote it. But I think the house is sort of covered in just fried chicken everywhere. And he realizes he can't work there anymore, so he stops. But um, it was really a very weird feeling to try to imagine, like, what would it be like for someone who really identifies as a bird? I mean, I I really took it very literally, you know, in certain ways. Um, I wanted to go there. But what was surprising for me was in the end, I found that he had so much in common with himself, with us. You know, our, our, our coming of age, strangely, is, is like a coming of becoming human in a way. Um, so he ended up being less weird or crazy than I thought he would. Like his experience with trying to get the jobs or the experience with a girlfriend, like he tries to learn like how does he kiss, you know, how does he do more, you know, and he's like watching like pornography to like understand what happens with men and women which is the wrong place to go, right? But, but, or, or the right, I don't know. But it seems to me like this, a generation of millennials is raised on like YouTube porn too, which wasn't how it was when I was growing up. So it's like all these things to me were really interesting and in how much more realistic they were than fabulous actually in the end. That was a surprise for me, the writer. So yeah. And yeah, I never read that section. It's just far too disgusting. I, I mean, it's not really graphic, but for me it feels, because I think I very much relate to him. And it's, a very, it's one of the more painful scenes for him. And so it really is, I find it really upsetting that he unravels in that manner. <laughs> uh, anything else? Yes. Where did you get the idea that you shouldn't be able to smile? Mm, great question. So that that is actually, there's only two facts. There's only one behavioral analyst in the world who's an expert on feral children. And as you'd imagine, she's not often taken that seriously, but she has you know, real, not credentials in feral children, but I don't know, child psychology or something. And she's in the UK, and I re- started reading some interviews with her when I first got the idea. And, and I, was, I actually contacted her, but then I realized I just wanted my imagination to take over. I didn't want too much information. But something that stuck with me was there's two things that she believed all feral children had in common. Um, one was that they could not smile or laugh, so they couldn't express any joy in their face. And the other thing was that they were scared of mirrors. That second one made a lot of sense to me, being scared of mirrors, sure. You know, you grew up without mirrors, then maybe they didn't see their reflection in any water, that made sense. But it was really upsetting to me, the idea that they couldn't smile or laugh. And they could express every other, they knew how to cry, they could express anger, sadness, all other, they were totally fine in that way, but they could not even understand how to get their face into a configuration of a smile. I thought that was so interesting. It's such a big part of what makes us human, is the ability to laugh and smile. Sometimes when we cry, I think we seem the most like animals. There's something animal in expressing pain or grief or anger, you know? I mean, you can even do it in front of your pets, you know, and they understand that you're upset much more than if you simply just smile at them or... or um, so this was really interesting to me. And I was reading a lot of Thich Nhat Hanh at the time, too, who I love, you know, the great um, Buddhist, uh, well, scholar, but guru, too. And he, I loved a quote by him that was, uh, was going to be an ep- epigraph originally, but wasn't, but I'm going to butcher it now. But basically, he said that he was trying to say that, you know, without smiling and without laughter, there can be no peace on earth. And he had this amazing um, concept that the problem with Western culture is we waited for things to entertain us to then laugh or smile, but he always said you have to lead with the smile and the laughter and then happiness comes. So I thought it was so interesting and it really has changed my world view in a lot, a lot of ways, hearing him speak in Denver once and he said that. Um, so yeah, that's where that comes from. That, that's actually one of the facts and that was really for me very poignant and just gave me, there's certain facts that writers really latch on to like that seem juicy for us and just lend themselves to both literal and figurative, um, you know, inspiration. And so I, that one was a huge one for me. So he, he, that's a big struggle for him too, is that he's constantly trying to, he always seems like he's on the verge of laughter or the verge of smiling, it never really happens. It finally does happen at a key moment, but um, later.
Yes. Your fascination with birds and flying, falling, that comes, yeah. comes across. Yeah. Where does that come from? It's really a great question. I mean, very weirdly, my first novel, there's a lot of birds, and then my, my first novel, in fact, has birds on the cover. I mean, it's like the informing myth of the narrative in the first novel, what I kind of call the, my own mythology for that book, was this story that the father tells the son of them burning birds, actually. It's funny, because that came up in this, too. I don't feel violently towards birds, but <laughs> weirdly, birds are a symbol that are in a lot of my work, and it's just, I find it really interesting to myself because I, I don't really like birds, actually. Um, and I only have these feathers on my hand because of what I read you, the preface of Seymour. This is like a symbol of safety, really. But I don't particularly love feathers or birds or really any of that stuff. Um, but I do think they're metaphorically rich, and a lot of writers I like have been inspired by, by avian imagery. So for me, like a big inspiration here that you can't really see, it's just a very abstract inspiration, was Robert Penn Warren's Audubon of Vision, which almost no, has anyone read that in here? I mean, nobody reads this. It's a, it was released in 1969 as an independent book. It was a poetic sequence. There's about, I don't know, about 15 maybe movements in this book length poem. And it was his, um, you know, like his retelling of the Audubon story, sort of biographical in a way, but and it becomes an, like an apocalyptic, um, sort of magical, mystical uh, piece of art. I don't even know how to describe it. It's one of the weirdest things I've ever read. And so, like, his obsession with Audubon became really interesting to me because Audubon, of course, was someone who had to kill the thing he loved in order to study it. And that was, to me, so, so rich metaphorically. And of course, you know, symbols of peace, perhaps, doves. I mean, there's the doves in my first book that get burned. And um, so that, of course, comes up, certainly, um, in you know, both Middle Eastern lore, but also even more pop culturally and politically, too. Um, I do know I love the Seymour character in the Shah Ahmed because Seymour is this benevolent, like, magical beast that, like, will always be there, you know? And that, that's the closest to a, de a real deity in the Shah Ahmed. There's demons and other sorts of, like, godlike things, but um, I love this bird god that we have in our culture. It's really beautiful. Um, but yeah, it's very interesting to me. People do not know what to make of this. Someone has written a dissertation about avian imagery in my work, <laughs> which is very exciting, but I was bad at tell talking to him about it because I didn't, it was only after I wrote them that it came up. It's not in my, it's not, and in fact, I've written a foreword for a book called The Blind Owl by Sadr Hidayat, who's the great, great Iranian writer 1937 book, and so then there's bird stuff there. You know, it's all full of bird stuff, my whole thing. But not, not, not my third or fourth books. No birds. No birds allowed. We're done with that. So, yeah, no. It's very, very weird to me, too. But uh, my, you know what? I, actually, one thing I will add is I was at an, in San Francisco doing a reading, and my mother was with me. I brought her on one leg of the book tour, which was a mistake. But... Because she, it was just so boring for her. She was just like, okay, your reading is great. And then she just, she, she thought it would be glamorous, but it wasn't. So anyways, we, an interviewer was interviewing me at dinner and then asked me about a similar question. And I said, very similar answer. My mother interrupted and she goes, no, 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 I know why. And I was like, oh, tell me, I don't, what, why, you know? And she believes it's because when we left uh, the Iran-Iraq war, that there had been all these like air raids and things like that. And so as a child, when I got to the US, I was scared of anything in the air, like blimps especially, but also hot air balloons or even some planes or helicopters. So she thought it was a phobia that had developed. But I'm not scared now, but I, I don't like airplanes. And of course I witnessed, you know, part of 9-11 happening outside my window. That was not helpful. It was right after an emergency landing, too. So Plains and I have had trouble. But she thinks that's the origin. So I think that's interesting. What would you uh, say about Iranian culture that would be similar to ours or very different? Ooh, wow. That's a hard one. Um, well, in many ways, I mean... 
Iranians to me, and there are Iranians here in the audience who might disagree, I think are the most Western of the Eastern people, let's say. I mean, certainly in a very superficial way, you could say that too, just politically say, I mean, that, that the sort of, it's, it's so ludicrous to see like Iran and the US being at odds as they've been in the last three decades when Iran was like the best friend of the US for so long in so many ways, you know. Um, so there's that part of it, but um, otherwise, there aren't, I don't think, that many similarities, really. I mean, well, the other thing is, I mean, it's unfair maybe in a way because America is like a baby culture, right? We only have 200-something years of history. But my dad never let me forget that we were from the Persian Empire <laughs> and, and that that was, you know, like, okay. But let's just say Western culture maybe. But um, no, I think there's so many differences, actually, uh, there's so many etiquette things I always think about. It's all these impossible etiquettes with, in Persian culture. That, that's the thing I often think about the most. Because, for instance, if I were talking to you guys and there were some people standing in back of me, I would be very uncomfortable. Do you know, you know that feeling? So as Iranians, you can't turn your back to anyone, especially if elders. Absolutely not. But I still, when I teach, I sometimes teach in a circular set up and there's students behind me and I'm just an, a, a wreck during it. It's almost superstitious. It seems really wrong. Or, you know, Iranians, you can't really compliment them. If you compliment them, they say like, oh, no, no, you know. And that keeps, goes on and on and on. Or, or you also, if, if you compliment someone, it's like bad luck a little bit. So then parents will say, they'll say, oh, your daughter is so beautiful and so smart. And my parents will always say, oh, no, she's very average and she doesn't look good. You know, she doesn't. But that was a way of keeping me safe from the, it's a kind of like an evil eye thing, but it's like a, a safety thing. You know, I don't want too many eyes admiring a thing. So it was a loving thing. But I grew up always hearing from my parents that I was stupid and of, you know, average looks at best, you know, and, and I was nothing. But they would do that a lot. Um, so those things are, are often kind of uh, funny to me. But, you know, my parent, my, my, I'm a strange maybe case because my name is actually Zoroastrian and my family was interested in Zoroastrianism. Of course, you have to be born into it and that's why that religion is dying out. But, um, so, but otherwise, my family was fairly atheistic, maybe agnostic at best. So I don't have much of the religious stuff that a lot of Iranians grew up with, you know. My family would not identify really as Muslim. In fact, it's not until after 9-11 that I became a vocal sort of spokesperson for some Muslim causes, even though I always say I'm not Muslim and there are even things I have problems with. But because of what happened in the post-9-11 era and this horrific marginalization of a lot of Middle Easterners, all around the world, I felt that I had to. I, I felt culturally Muslim in a way, so I felt. So yeah, no, but I think they're pretty different. I think, yeah. Yes. Do you ever miss uh, California? Do I miss California? Oh, um, God, is anyone here from California? Okay, I'm like, are we safe here? Um, I don't love Los Angeles, where I'm from. Well, Pasadena, but also I lived in Los Angeles many times in my adulthood, too. I don't love it. I think it's gone a little better now because actually East Coast people have moved over there and have t turned it into more of an art city and Europeans and things like that. It's much more cosmopolitan now than it used to. But growing up there in the 80s, it was just all entertainment industry. And I don't know. I, I don't know if it's the best place to raise kids. I don't, there was a bad messages all around me, I felt. And I never met a living writer until I was 18 in my first workshop here at Sarah Lawrence. I, there was no readings around me. There was one good bookstore, which is the Great Romans in Pasadena. That was an amazing bookstore. But aside from, we didn't really go, to that, go there. My parents didn't take me there. So I just really didn't know anything about writers. But I always, on my bulletin board, would have photos of the Empire State Building and things like that. And I love NY and all this stuff. I just wanted to come here. I knew I would love it when I came here, and I did. And um, just like I knew I wanted to be a writer, I kind of had set out what my future was going to be like at a very young age. <laughs> young immigrants often do. Um, but yeah, I don't really miss California. I like the seasons, so that doesn't bother me. And um, I don't know, I think there's a lot of advantages to the East Coast, you know? I don't know, people, I just find that you just have libraries and things, bookstores, and there's a lot of like creative and, and intellectual culture seems everywhere. 
And that was, I was starved for that growing up in LA. I just, I just didn't ever meet anyone I wanted to be like when I grew up, you know? It was just like, I don't know. It was just depressing for me. I was, I was very nerdy and I liked that about myself, but everything in LA culture told me that that was bad, you know? So New York really saved me. And so I, I, I think I now identify, so now I've lived like basically half my life in New York and I identify more as a New Yorker, I think, if New York will have me. But I would like to think of, well, the New York Times helped that a little bit, people that, you know, but I don't know. I, I, I really would never want to move. I live in it. I have once years ago done that with my first book, and I would be happy to do it again for my second book. But actually, Sarah Lawrence has not asked me yet, but maybe they will. Um, I like I, a lot of the students there. You know, write me, and I, I'm aware actually of a lot of students there, and many of the faculty, the same faculty that were there when I was a student. So I'm still very close to quite a few members of the faculty. So yeah, I'd be happy to, but. I think Concordia has a more impressive reading series, certainly, than, I don't know what's going on with Sarah Lawrence. They should really be doing more. Is anyone from Sarah Lawrence here? Let's get like a reading series. Yeah, they do it, but it's all like kind of fragmented. Like it's like a department will invite you, but it'll just be like, but I think, you know, a school is such a great like literary tradition and great history, they should do, I don't know. But yeah, I'd be happy to. I don't, I don't know if I will. But. Well, my book was, my, most of my book tour was in the summer, too, so school was, I'm just getting, you know, I'm going to be in Princeton on Friday, and I'm just sort of, tomorrow, and I'm starting to just do the colleges now, so we'll see. Yes? I'm just wondering, when you're writing in the voice of a character such as self, mm -hmm. how much of what um, he thinks, feels, does, takes you completely by surprise, and how much feels very um, known to you? Um, in this case, a lot of it did surprise me. But what surprised me is I thought I was going to be writing about something that was very far from me because I thought that was too much with my first book. My first book was so autobiographical that at one point um, when we were in the copy editing stage, someone from my publishing house sent me the manuscript to look over the edits and said, wait a sec, I just sent it to your home address and that's the same address in the book. And I said, oh, right. You know, I had my parents' phone number in there. I mean, I was nuts. I just kept it all in there. I think a little bit like to spite them possibly, but I don't remember. But anyways, it was so close to me that I wanted in the second book to write something that was not so close to me. But it, it, actually Zal is the character that I relate to more than any character. So that was really surprising that as I was writing him, a lot of the memories of, of being an immigrant and trying to adapt to life in the US really came back to me, stuff I'd completely forgotten. Um, a lot of like his issues, like how he felt in New York before 9-11 up to the event, I really related to. You know, I felt there was this period there that like I was 23 when 9-11 happened, I felt very much a little bit lost. You know, the economy had kind of tanked in like December 2000, I think it was. And, a lot of us had gone from this feeling where we would all be making six figures after college. You know, there were all this like dot com stuff. You know, everyone had money, and then suddenly, I had a job right after I graduated. Yeah, everyone I knew had a job right after they graduated, and then everyone just lost it. It was just a few months later, and so there was that feeling of being really lost in New York. That summer before 9/11, I felt utterly lost, and it, I had no idea how spoiled I actually was and how much we actually had. You know, like I tell these millennial students, I have like, there was a time that no one thought about taking off their shoes in the airports. Like, that they've just grown up with that. They believe this is like a weird ritual that we almost have now. Um, that we, when we go to airports, we take off our shoes. In our culture, this is what we do. It's crazy, you know? But, and, and the people used to meet you right up at your gate, you know? and things like that, and they don't have any sense of this, and they live in fear all the time. I was never afraid of anything. I never thought about terrorism. I knew a little bit from the 80s, but that was like kind of become like movies for me, you know, it wasn't really real. But a lot came back to me, and I, it became, this is, I talk about this book, like those years that I was writing this were very difficult years for me. A lot of bad things happened in my life, and I felt this book felt even though it's actually not that dark when you read it, but for me, it felt like a lot of my neuroses and problems are in this book. So it always, I really felt like I was living this kind of torture that my bird boy was living. And even this, the, the world felt dangerous a little bit to me. 
So um, a lot of this book, I'm trying to recreate that feeling of those that, that year or two leading up to 9-11 and then the very months before, which to me, I, you know, I did so much research on them and I had my own emails and things like that I looked at. It's just very interesting what the world was like. Well, I guess as a follow-up, based on your answer, once you write about it, can you work it through and can you leave it? Well, then you, but then you publicize it. And for me, like my first novel for about se seven years, basically up till this book came out, I was still doing readings for that one. So I'm very grateful I had a long life, mainly because of academia. I really owe universities for that. It's not like bookstores were not trying to still promote it. But um, so I was still in that world completely. And I get, I'm guessing, I think because some universities are looking at this too, I'll probably be reading from this for a while too. So you're still half in it, even though you've got these other projects that you're doing. So it's funny, like when I read it out loud, I still remember how my voice sounded when I was writing it, because I often read things out loud as I write it. And so it's always in the same intonation, <laughs> not as I've done in the press season, but in composing the book. So it does bring me back to that feeling of like what it was like to write it then. But every book becomes kind of a testament to an era of your life. You know, now I'm, these projects I'm working on are so different. So you know, um, but this will always be this like book that was written and actually at a period that I was very ill and I didn't know I was ill. I didn't know that I had Lyme disease, but I was essentially like decaying, everything was going wrong in my body and I, and my mind. And, and uh, so there was like a lot of that here in this, in the, um, in the um, sort of aura of this book in some ways, but um, but I think because I'm just sort of naturally interested in humor and my worldview tends towards the humorous, um, there just had to be some, a lot of lightness in here too, because I can't really, I'm not, I'm pretty, I'm not one of those very serious people in general. I mean, I'm serious, I guess, about certain things, but humor is essential. It's not optional. I can't really be friends with people or have people around me that are not humorous in some way. It's very funny you ask this, Kathy, because you don't actually know that tomorrow I'm going to be going back to my natural black hair color. I just made the appointment today. I just couldn't handle it anymore. All you people that are blondes deserve, well, if you're a fake blonde like I was, you deserve a medal for your dedication to your hair. It is the most difficult thing in the world to do to maintain blonde hair. And I had platinum hair through much of the winter. It was for an article I did for Elle magazine about like, kind of like the history of platinum blondes and my own experience with it. And it became this big thing. And the New York Times interviewed me about my hair, which I was like, can you talk about my book, please? But they want to talk about my hair. And then in transitioning out of platinum, I had this like hair colorist to stars. She's like Lady Gaga's hair colorist and all these like, She's like very hip, and I was getting it all for free, you know, because it was for these magazines. Anyway, she was like, we want to have fun with it. You want to do colors? And I was like, sure, because school was out. That's always my worry is I don't want students, you know, they're like obsessed with any tidbit about our lives that they could latch on to. So I just didn't want any more spectacle. I was already platinum. So then, yeah, I did pinks and purples and blues. And it was funny because the 90s have come back in, and that was when I was a teenager, and so it's like, a lot of those weird hair colors that you found then are sort of in. So I had fun with that. And then it just went to this. And now I just can't wait to just get back to my natural black because it's very difficult to maintain unnatural colors. But yeah. Yeah, so tomorrow, I'd have, this is the last time anyone will see me, I think, ever <laughs> as, as a blonde of any sort. Take yourself. I know, I know. Tonight I should go on a selfie like uh, rampage. Um, well, I took a lot when I was blonde because I was so fascinated because he looks so different. But the weird thing is, actually, my bird boy is blonde in this book because he is kind of born with something like al an albino like condition. Um, and I did not realize that when I was doing it to myself, but it would come up in interviews. They'd say, Oh, you kind of now look like the bird boy. And I was like, Oh, you know, I thought like blonde was going to be really glamorous, but I think on me it just looks kind of like awkward and a little androgynous. <laughs> so I actually did look kind of like this weird bird boy, you know? I had a Lyme relapse. I was incredibly thin through the first 
wave of the publicity for this. So I was just like this like frazzled thin creature with like broken white hair, horrible. And people were like, oh, it's because of your book. And I was like, no, but okay, sure, you know. So, no. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much, and I'll be out there. Thank you.